So this video is not too bad really, except that I must make some apologies up front. If you've arrived at my video hoping for best practice use of object oriented programming to create a multiplayer scoring system, then I've got the sad duty to inform you that that's not what will be happening here today. In all the exemplar material and practice questions provided to us by the exam board, they just misuse OOP so badly that it makes me want to cry. So badly, seriously, it's terrible. Please never do this in your real job, your real projects or anything, but it is the way the exam board have been doing it for a while. So we need to know how to build the dodgy version that they want. Well, with that disclaimer out of the way, let's take a look at what we want to do. In our game so far, we have two characters that can be controlled by different players. They're both trying to collect the treasure chest. Our pirate captain reaches the chest first and collects it, increasing her score by one. The treasure chest respawns at a random location, and it's an exciting race to see who collects the second chest. What we need to happen is that when the second character reaches the chest, it should make the pop noise, disappear, increase a different score counter for our second player, and then respawn again in a random location. When you're asked to build this level of functionality, you'll be given another actor class called Counter 2. Let's go in and see what's what in that code. So what's different here compared to the original counter? Well, look at the variable names. We've got our score set as the integer total count 2. The first method is called counter 2 and the bump count method is called bump count 2. All they've done is added a 2 onto the name of everything, which works, but this is not OOP done properly. I'll stop moaning about that and we'll get a copy of counter 2 added to the world. As usual, simply right click on this actor, select new counter 2 and then click to place the counter where you want it. Please check the diagram you'll be provided with to see exactly where they want you to place it. Save your world so that we don't lose the counter if we recompile or reload. Then let's go into the code of the world we're in to see what it's done to add the counter. Double click on island to see the code and let's scroll right down to the bottom to see what's been added by us inserting counter 2. So just like we've done before with the original counter, we need to move the declaration of the counter 2 itself out of the prepare method and into the main body of the code. Simply identify the relevant line and move it to an empty space between the get counter method which you wrote earlier and the prepare method. You'll remember that what we were doing here was increasing the scope of the variable so that it was accessible from any point that the program is running. We now need to create a method to return the value of counter2 to any other object that requests it, but we've already done that for the original counter, so it makes this step very easy. Copy all of the code for the original getCounter method, everything from the public declaration to the closing curly brace, then simply paste it below the line we just moved. We need to make a few changes, but just like the exam board did, this is just a case of us adding a few twos to the variable names. We need to change a few here. We've got the type of object, counter2, capital C, which needs to replace the return type in the first line. Cool. We then need to change the name of this function because we've already got one called getCounter. Hmm. I wonder what we can call this one. How about get counter two? Real genius at work here, folks. The last change we need to make is to the name of the variable that we are returning, which you'll be shocked to learn is going to change from counter into counter two, lowercase c. So here's a beautifully animated video tutorial simply to explain that you put a two in a few different places. Complex stuff. Again though, please remember this isn't good practice, it's just what we need to do to replicate the way the exam board do it. With that code updated, let's compile it to check it works. Looks good to me. Now the next thing to do is to track down all that lovely code we've already written on the first player to deal with the collision detection. We've already put that in the pirate, so let's get her code open. 
So this section right at the end is what we're looking for. This is all the code that we wrote to deal with the collision. And you'll be excited to learn that all we need to do is to copy this. Get yourself into the code for the second character and paste it below the movement code that you wrote earlier. You need to update a few variable names that are related to the counter here because player2 is using counter2. So once again, we need to hover our finger over that 2 button because we need to make a few changes. Firstly, we're changing three things in the counter declaration line. Counter, capital C, to counter2, capital C. This changes the type of object to a counter2 object. The variable name counter needs to become counter2, and even the get counter function needs to be a get counter2 function. Inside the if statement, we've got another reference to the variable counter, which needs to become counter2, and counter2's bump count method was actually called bump count2, so change that as well. Well, that's it. A few twos in the right place, and we're pretty much done. Compile to check. Yep, all good. And let's try it out. Our captain collects the first chest, and her score becomes 1. But the treasure respawns close to our first mate, and he collects the treasure where his score increases too. And that's it. You've got a reasonably fun two-player game now. Build it, run it, enjoy it. Get your marks for it. But please, don't ever take this video as an example of good object-orientated design, because it's not at all.